Well, welcome back. Now, on Thursday the 3rd of May 2007 in the Portuguese ho holiday resort of uh, Praia de Luz, three-year-old Madeleine McCann from Leicester in England disappeared without trace. It has been just over four years since she vanished and since July 2008 no police force anywhere in the world has been actively looking for Madeleine. Yesterday was Madeleine's eighth birthday. I'm joined now by Madeleine's parents, Kate and Jerry McCann. You're both very welcome to the programme. Thanks for coming. I, I hope it's not an inappropriate question to begin with, but I think just to put a bit of context as to where we are and who you are, you might tell us a little bit about yourselves and you know, how, how you met and bring us up to date, just to kind of give us a more human look at, at you, because we've, we've seen the headlines, we've heard different stories, but tell us a little bit, if you would, about yourselves. And I'll start because yeah, you start, I, I, I think there's a bit of discrepancy in the book here. Um, okay. When we were both newly qualified doctors, we both went for the same job and uh, I was sitting waiting to go in to be interviewed and I saw this beautiful, young, long uh, uh, girl with long blonde hair. I was like, wow, she's beautiful. And we didn't actually speak. Um, but about six, neither of us got that job. Six months later, Kate moves, moved to Glasgow um, and we ended up working in the same hospital. So, I mean, I've been in Dundee as a medical student and did my first job there. Yeah. So it was February of 93 and we were both young doctors in Glasgow and okay. we didn't directly work together but our paths crossed socially. So. And you describe yourself as much shyer to Jerry. You say that you were the shy yeah. half of the part of and Jerry is a bit more of the outgoing well, character. definitely. I mean, I'm an only child so our house was quite quiet whereas, you know, Jerry's a baby of five kids and a very... Quite a loud family, I think. Yeah, so it's so a different... Yeah. Typically Irish, really. Yeah. yeah. You know, my, my three sisters and brother were all born in Donegal, so I'm the only one that was born in Glasgow, so it was pretty typical sort of Irish okay, Catholic so it's upbringing. It's a big, and, big uh, Donegal connection then. Yeah, I know, I know, it's fantastic. It's been over many, many times. I'm sure. Uh, and, and was it a case that, that you always wanted to have children, that you were very keen to be a mum very soon, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a secret to any of my family or friends really that I always wanted to be a mum and even in school and stuff I'd talk about you know having I was going to have five kids and you know that was like a cert um, and in my you know my medical school yearbook at the end it just says prognosis mathematician and mother of six yeah. so I was you know I was very half, definite about that halfway there halfway there you you had uh, difficulties initially isn't that right I mean you, you talk about this in the book but maybe you'd explain to us what those difficulties were and how you overcame them I suppose like most people you don't really anticipate problems and I just I guess I took it for granted really that you know I'd have children and all would be well so um, we got married when we when we were 30 so we weren't the youngest I guess and um, so I wanted to start a family as soon as possible yeah but it, it just didn't happen really and uh, two years down the path I knew to be honest I mean not even after six months I was, I was thinking this is doesn't seem quite right but when we got to two years um, I went to see a RGP and then he sent me for investigations and all that happened quite quickly and I was diagnosed with endometriosis which may or may not have been relevant but I underwent sort of surgery and laser treatment for that for a while we tried again it still didn't work so by that point really we knew that we were gonna need help so we went for IVF okay and along came Madeline yep and then along came the twins yeah and I'd like you to tell me a little bit about Madeline, if you would, uh, the baby and the, the little girl she would become. What was she like? Was she good? Was she bold? Was she difficult? Was she a pleasure? What, what? The first <laughs> How five, was she? At the first five months was a real shock. I mean, she was absolutely beautiful and we loved her to, to bits, but she had the most horrible colic and uh, we tried everything and she said, we won't use a dummy. Or, and it was just everything we tried and sure. nothing really seemed to work. And, I think for Kate and I, uh, that period, although it was lots of happiness and joy, we were working a full shift system, passing on, and I was still working. And if I if I get home any later than six o'clock, there was trouble because Kate hard. was standing there. I, mean, she was in, I need the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> she was in a lot of pain. I mean, anyone who's had a baby's had colic, you know, yeah. they can't articulate because they're babies. Yeah, but yeah. like a little fist would be clenched and sure. a face would be purple, and you just feel really helpless because you, you know, it's really hard to ease that pain. But she got through that at about five months, yeah. and. Um, I mean, she was just awake constantly, Madeline. Do you know what I mean? She's just so alert, taking it all in. And I sometimes think that was maybe why she always seemed a little bit ahead of the game, because she was just absorbing everything, you know. And as she got a little bit older when she was one, two, three, what sort of a child was she? 
Oh, she's absolutely great fun. Uh, she? Pers bags of personality. She's a little mimic. Really? And uh, yeah, she could she could do accents and things, yeah. and she'd love doing role playing and full of energy, like round the garden. It would be chase me, chase me, and another thing. My quality time with her was watching sort of Doctor Who, and when, once the twins went to bed, or Robin Hood, and but she was yeah, great. She loved all that. You think at that age, you know, it'd be too scary, but yeah. she loved Doctor Who. And she was getting really Robin into Hood, music, wasn't Superman. She? You were going music. to have a little disco for her. Well, yeah. When um, well, I mean, it's for a, a fourth birthday obviously which we, we didn't have but her best friend actually was born on the same day just by chance so they were having a gonna have a joint party together and it was going to be their first disco yeah so i bought um a cd really of girl bands yeah. you know so she was moving into that realm. yeah so she was in all that and yeah. i mean one of my funniest memories was just uh, driving along and this little voice in the back was <laughs> I just had this little voice going go ship Go share. And I'm thinking, what is she on about? And I knew the tune, but I just, and she was, you know, it was basically Don't You by the Pussycat Dolls. Oh, don't dolls, you think yeah. you're going Yeah. But so that's the, so she was really, she was again, ahead of the game by, by knowing songs and words she and, was, and enjoying she, herself. She was a real character, you know, and she's very engaging. But. Uh, when was it decided that you were going to go to Portugal for a holiday? What happened? It was on uh, New Year's Day, uh, 2007, and our very good friends Fiona and Dave came round with, yeah. with their children and they mentioned that they were, they were going to be going with other friends of theirs who we know, who we know as well and they said, do you fancy it? And you know, Jerry got the laptop out and was looking at the resort and everything. And yeah. I'd like, we hadn't, Kate and I hadn't been a Mark Warner uh, holiday before but Dave and Fiona had and, uh, and it looked great and we're quite sporty and um, we thought, and it was hard work with the kids, don't get me wrong, we love them and everything, but yes. you felt, well, at least the kids would get a holiday, we'd get to spend time and get to do a little bit of things together as yes. well. And we have always tried to do that, is to c keep time for ourselves um, yes. at some point. So it, it, to me, it looked great. Kate was a bit more hesitant, just about the packing, with going with three kids. Uh, yeah toddlers essentially and the hassle playing and I just didn't know we'd had some really good breaks in centre parks and you know we'd all loved it and to me it just seemed you know going on a plane with all your baggage and it's an ordeal just, yeah, yeah. So, I and mean, that was all but you know I was the one that finally had to be convinced to go really and I got you know everyone else was very enthusiastic so and who did you go with Kate who, who, who were your friends on the trip were they so uh, apart from David and Fiona, who yeah. we went, we went with uh, Matt and Rachel. Matt's another doctor who I'd worked with and, uh, in the hospital for six months. And then another couple, uh, Russell and Jane. And I'd happened to work with uh, Russell yes. as well for six months. So we all knew each other, although Russell and uh, Matt are, were more friends with Dave and Fiona, who are like, our best friends in Leicester. So we kind of, there was... We all kind of knew each other. And, yeah. and Fiona's mum. So there were nine yeah. adults. Nine adults. And, all, and, and all had kids and probably felt, sure, look, they, we'll all be in the same boat visiting yeah. kids and going yeah. out yeah. and so on. Um, you developed, or you, you worked out a kind of a routine, didn't you, when you got there that, that seemed to work for you. Would you tell us a little bit about that, about, uh, particularly in the evening time when you were going for dinner and so forth. So what was, the, what was that routine that, that you, you started to get into that groove? In the evening, well, well, the first night we went to a restaurant called the Millennium Restaurant. Yes. But it was actually, it was over half a mile away, um, which when you've got three little kids and you don't have a buggy, it actually turns out to be a really long walk. <coughs> Sorry, especially at that time of night when they're all a bit weary. Of it, it was open quite late. So from the next night, we went to the Tapaz restaurant, which was close to the apartment. Um, the problem with that one was you had to book on that morning, so there was no certainty if you'd be able to, you know, to get a table or not. Yeah, we kind of fell into the routine and it was nearby, it was adjacent to our apartment and the decision sort of processes for us were we kept the kids in the routine so it was after their tea, bath, um, jammies on, milk, story in bed and they were asleep between 7 and 7.30 every night and rather than saying we put the kids in the creche and disturb them and bring them back we said we'll just eat in the tapas area and we'll come back and check them and other Mark Warner resorts do do baby listening and collectively we decided that that's what we do really just to check the kids weren't crying. Uh, Before we get into too much detail about that there was a point wasn't there that you, I think you made this in the point in the, in, the, in the book Kate about the reservation that you made that uh, to say look we'll take the whole week here and and you you point out that that, that was uh, something that would concerned you retrospectively. That isn't that right? 
Well, on, on the um, Monday morning, Rachel, one of our friends, asked the receptionist, is there any way we could book it for the rest of the week? And she, she explained, you know, obviously we're, we've got the children sleeping in the apartments nearby and it was very difficult at that time of night to take them to Millennium Restaurant. So the receptionist, um, who I believe was trying to be very kind, made a note of it in the staff book. She said, I'll ask and we'll hopefully we'll get that reservation. But I discovered in the, the police files, which weren't released till, till August 2008, that in December 2007, there was a note. Um, I discovered, sorry, there was an entry into the police files in December 2007 that the receptionist had actually written in the staff book, can this group have a table reserved for the week because they're leaving the children alone in the apartment. And um, when I discovered that, uh, I just felt sick because I just thought, well, this is in a staff book, which by nature is seen by all staff. And it was also in the reception area, which obviously guests um, go through. And it may not have made any difference, sure. I don't know. But, but it's another thought process. To me, I, I think you, to. you know, you're I notifying people that I, the children are there on their own. I suppose the thing for us, looking back at it, we got into this routine from the Sunday through to the Thursday night. And we were checking very regularly. And we know whoever took Madeline, it was a high-risk strategy. And you think someone's been, with hindsight, someone's been watching you and watching your routines and if they knew the kids were there. So all these little things to us now have taken on a much greater significance. Was, was there an option to have child minders? Was there an option to have the, somebody uh, listening in what, by a reception? Were they options for you in the hotel as a matter of interest? No, or? there were babysitters, um, but they were, uh, I think they were limited. But, um, I mean... To be perfectly honest, we didn't really think we needed to be, but we were so close to the apartment. Yes. Uh, I've said this quite I mean, a few we, times. We didn't even consider it, to be honest. That's how safe we felt. I mean, yeah. you, probably, you may have heard that other Mark Warner resorts had what they call a baby listening service. Yes. So one of the staff will go around and listen outside the apartments to see if anyone's crying. Sure. But as it turned out, they didn't have one in, in Pride Deluge because it was a little bit more spread out, so it was harder for the staff to go around. But we effectively thought we were doing our own baby listening service, only it was Going like a child yes. checking. Because so we, we have, in, you, you, you reproduce in your book, Kate, the, this, this uh, map which shows the tapas bar, which is, I think, square A, is that right? That's yeah. right. And yeah. then your apartment in square B. So yeah. that's the swimming pool, might give you a bit of the geography of this. You're looking at uh, roughly how much time to walk from A to B. It's probably it's about... 30 to 45 seconds. So under a minute, we'll get you from yeah, one yeah, Well yeah. under a minute. Well yeah. under a minute. And the, the, the plan was to do this every 30 minutes that one, one yeah. of you will go. We'll get to that in a second because I want to talk about Wednesday, uh, the 2nd of May. And you had some class, as couples so often do, you had some class of a row. Um, can you tell me about that, Kate? Yeah, it, it wasn't actually a row, oh, to sorry. be honest. And, um, and we don't row. <laughs> but, um, okay. Basically, that was the only night when we weren't back in the apartment for 11 o'clock and we'd gone into the cover. It was really cold, actually. Every night, you know, we, I had five layers on actually sitting in the tapas area. Sure. But we went in for a drink in the, the little covered area. So it was actually 10 to 12 um, when we left that night. And Jerry, Jerry oh. was tired, basically, and he just said, right, I'm off, bye. I like, I like getting to bed early, yeah, yeah. which okay. is late for us. Yeah. What you see is what you get with Jerry, do you know what I mean? He's okay. kind of, so he's, he's not touchy feely. Yeah, he said, I'm off. Yeah. And uh, Dave just said to me, something like, oh, oh, that's right, he just joked and he said, oh, she's not that bad, Jerry, you know. And Anyway, I just kind of, I was a bit upset, I think, because he'd, okay. you know, he'd just gone off and I was still standing there. But And I don't know why it bothered me particularly, because I'm not usually that touchy. But anyway, I went back, literally five minutes later, I went back to the apartment, by which point Jerry's snoring. And I just, at that point, I just thought, he's snoring, my three lovely kids are in that room, and there's a spare bed, I'm sleeping in there. With the kids. And, you know, I wouldn't have even mentioned this in my book, um, because it is so unusual, sure. and, you know, I think we're very lucky, we do have a really good relationship. We don't row, and I know that is quite unusual, we don't, no, you that's know. that's good, yeah. And uh, other than when, like one of us has been on call or something, you know, we don't sleep in separate rooms. So I it was understand. really unprecedented. But because obviously after Madeline was taken, every detail was significant. That's why I've brought it up. So I did actually, on the Wednesday night, I did actually spend the night in the room with the children. And why is that significant, do you think? Well, I, I don't know if it is, to be honest, Ryan. It's yeah. just I felt I had to share absolutely everything. But wasn't Madeline upset the next day? Well, the, next, the next morning she said, um, 
mummy, I can't remember if it was mummy or daddy, no. but <coughs> why didn't you come when Sean and I were crying last night? And we both looked at each other and thought, that's odd, crying. And we didn't hear anything. Yes. And we had been back checking. And so we asked and said, when did you cry? And, you know, sometimes when we first put them to bed, they cried. And she just dropped it. And as we were saying, Madeline was very articulate. And we kind of looked at each other and thought, did they wake up? Or was it the night before when Amelie had woken up? And Kate had obviously slept in that room. So at the time, we weren't even sure that they had woken up. But now... I mean, hindsight, hindsight obviously, is a wonderful thing. But there, there was something about it that obviously stopped us in our track. Yes. And it was probably just because our main concern was that the children had woken up. I mean, never for one second did I think there was any anything sinister going on. I just thought, have they woken up? And obviously, you know, I was upset about that. I didn't, you know, if that had happened, then, you know. And do you rethink that then when you were going through with this fine comb? Is that the point that you, that you go, I wonder, was, were they disturbed by something or someone? Is that the point you... But absolutely. Yeah. I mean, at that time, I was, you know, I just thought, have they woken up? But I actually, at the end, I thought, probably didn't, to be honest, because sure. Madeline isn't one to hold back. But as soon as I discovered that Madeline had been taken, you know, that was the first thing yeah. that came into my head. And I thought, oh, my God, has someone tried the night before? You know? let's, let's go to that, that, that desperate day, the, the, thurs, the third of May. It was a Thursday. You were nearly on the way out the door uh, mm -hmm. from your holiday. Um, let's, let's, let's go to a happy moment for, first, for starters, which is the last time you, you spent with Madeline and, and with the twins. What was that? Do you, do you recall every moment? Is that etched in your mind, those, those last uh, hour or two of the... Yep. She was, on the first day, Madeline was really tired, and I remember by the time at least the children used to go from the kids' club yeah. <clears throat> to a little area next to the tapas area for like high tea. And I'd actually been for a run, and I, I met them back there. Jerry was already there, and she was absolutely shattered. Yes. She was really tired, and I said to her, "You're all right." And then she said to me, "Will you carry me, Mummy?" And th that was unusual, you know. But we, we just we put that down to you know we're getting towards the end of a holiday. Yeah. They'd done loads of activities. And I just thought she was really tired. So I carried Madeline back with the other children. We went back. We, got, we, de we decided we'd get them bathed and ready for bed because we they were so tired, as opposed to going to the play area, which yeah. we usually did. Jerry was playing. They had like a, a men's tennis night between six and seven. So Jerry went for that. And I just sat down on the couch with the, the three kids and had some treats and biscuits and crisps and stuff. And um, she sat on my lap and just cuddled in and... She often liked to put my, my engagement ring on. So she had that on her finger and then we read a story and it, it was, you know, it was lovely. You know, it was what just story a, did you read, Kate? Well, that, we had two. Um, yeah. One when we were sitting there was, was a, a Judith Care book called Mog, which is one of Madeline's favourites. Cat. Yeah. Yes. And we've got lots of Mog books. Yeah. And then when we went through to the bedroom and we were all sitting on Madeline's bed, we had um, If You're Happy and You Know It. So you were all getting involved in that as, yeah. as any normal family. The thing about it was Madeline was having such a brilliant holiday yeah. and she was the oldest of the, all the kids and little ringleader and having so much fun. And I remember the photograph that afternoon when I was sitting by the paddling pool with her and she was just having a ball. That night you, 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 went, you kept to your routine and you went out to the tapas bar and you had your meal. You checked once. You had a, your, one of your friends checked the, the twice because he decided that... She, you, you said, I'll, I'll go next time, so that was fine. And I think it was the third time, it was the 10 o'clock check, right. that, Kate, you went, it was your turn, yeah. and you went back to the apartment. Um, this is where your life changed, for all the wrong reasons. Um, what did you find when you went in the door at that, 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 that time? Well, I went in through the, the patio doors, and I just stood in this sitting area, <clears throat> and it was all quiet. And then I just looked over towards the bedroom door, and it was m open much further than we'd left it because we usually just have it quite closed over but so enough light gets in. And at that point I thought, has Matt left it open when he's checked on them? <coughs> Sorry. So I, I thought, well, I'll pull the door back over again. And just as I was pulling it to, it just slammed. So I, I, like a draft had caught it. So I turned behind me and checked that it wasn't the patio doors that I hadn't left them open, which I hadn't. So then I went back to open the door again, just so it was open a little bit. And as I opened it, that's when I looked into the room. And it was really dark, but I couldn't quite make Madeline out. And I was looking at the pillow and thinking, is that a head? Is it not? And, and, then, I, and then I realised, actually, oh, oh, she's not there. And I thought, I wonder if she's gone through to our bedroom. And that would explain why the, why the door was open a bit more. So I went through to our bedroom. 
and she wasn't there. And that, that is the first point, really, when the panic just hit. And I went straight back into their bedroom, and just as I did that, there was a, another gust of wind, and the curtains which were drawn just kind of flew out and flew open. And then I saw that the shutters were all the way up and the window was pushed right across, and I just knew. Just knew. And I just... Um, I ran to the window, and I have no idea what I thought I was going to find, but ran to the window, and then I just whizzed around the house the flat for the t you know, 10, 15 seconds. And again, I, I knew she'd been taken, but I just thought, you know, just in case she's, I don't know, cowering in a cupboard or something. And then I just flew out the back of the apartment and um, ran to the table. And uh, I was just screaming, Madeline's gone, someone's taken her. And it was just disbelief when I saw Kate and I was shouting, she can't be gone, isn't She can't be gone and Kate was distraught and since she's gone, someone's taken her. And, I got to the apartment in seconds running and I found it as Kate described it and I did the same things, checked everything and then I went over to the window and I lowered the shutter and I went out through the front door and I found I could lift the shutter up from the outside and I just knew as well that someone had taken There was no way she could have got out of that apartment alone and with the window open like that. And you, could, you could open the shutter from outside? Yeah. That you must could. have been a pretty sickening uh, well, I discovery. Mean, I think it, it was already, I think everyone knows the terror you have when yes. you lose a child in a supermarket yes. or something, even for seconds or a minute. Well, that was developing, and then when I did that, the pit in my stomach, and I just felt, you know, and terror, just absolute terror. And we, but, you know, we started searching right away, so the, the, the boys split up, and me and Dave went one way, Matt and Russell went round the immediate blocks and shouting her name, and when we didn't find her, I asked Matt, to go down to 24 hour reception and call the police. We didn't even know the emergency number, we didn't speak Portuguese and, and then after half an hour the police still hadn't turned up and we were frantic, absolutely frantic and asked Matt to go back again and that's the first time at, at 22.40 even though it was just after 10 we raised the alert, that was the first time the police logged the call and yeah. then it was another 20 minutes till they came. And then all the language barriers and everything. And then they called the judicial police at midnight. And it was about another hour before they arrived. In the meantime, Mark Warner had organised a search around the vicinity. But every second felt like a minute. And every minute was like an hour in the night. All these just opportunities lost through, as you say, translation and then just pure I think by inability. the time the criminal police arrived, it was almost four hours since Madeline had been taken. Four hours, yeah. Um, why did you, Kate, why did you think immediately that she was abducted and hadn't wandered out of the apartment or gone somewhere? Why, why, did that, why was that such a gut reaction for you, do you think? Well, there was absolutely no way a three-year-old could open those shutters and the Simple window. Simple as that. Simple as that. Yeah. You know, and people, you know, obviously people saying she, she didn't wander off. I'm saying, well, the shutter was open, the window was open. I'm not lying about that. And even if they want to say theoretically, oh, she wandered out the back of the apartment, then yeah. you basically saying a three-year-old has opened the long curtains, closed them behind her, opened the patio doors, closed them behind her, opened the gate at the top of the stairs, closed that behind With her. With the chair lock. And, and done, done the same at the bottom. I mean, it was just not... It's not possible. When, when the world's press descended uh, at the resort, and I, can, I can't begin to imagine what you were going through, and yet you wanted them because you kind of needed them there to, to highlight the cause and then... I think though the, the, the immediate reaction when we got back from the police station was shock at the number that had turned up. Yeah. Really. And you know, we wanted to make it clear, we didn't actually call the media and although we had the debate overnight when nothing seemed to be happening and... But other people had called the media, Rachel had called a friend from BBC and friends at home who we'd been spoken to and we'd alerted the British consul and were saying nothing's been done. I just remember we were ringing people at home just screaming, Frantic. just full of fear Frantic. and saying please help us. And praying, so praying, we felt yeah. so helpless. We are just, I mean, we were on our knees and... But the media, I mean, my immediate reaction was uh, I thought about media intrusion and the destruction Dress, that everything we had, but at the same time, something was kicking in saying, we've got to appeal, we've got to appeal for information. What happened when, were you aware that people were saying, oh, look, at, look at Kate McCann, she's very cold. I, I saw her laugh there one day. Uh, I think Jerry smiled one day. Uh, she was jogging. She mustn't care. I mean, you were accused of many things. They sedated the children. Um, later on, they suggested that you, you may have had a part in the, the disappearance, even the murder of Madeline. You were accused of 
everything. You have the book thrown at you. Yeah. What do you do when that's happening to you? It's a terrible situation, actually. Just, I mean, apart from your daughter going missing, the other thing that we need to mention is that we were told explicitly that we couldn't talk about detail of the, the actual investigation. Did that under, make you seem evasive then? No, no, but under judicial secrecy. Yes. And the police weren't allowed to talk, and then we were getting all these leaks and then lies and smears and misinformation that was put out and it was almost impossible to combat it because we weren't actually allowed to say anything yeah. and no one was actually releasing so there was one very and i strongly feel it was a, a strategic approach to because of the media attention and pressure from the uk particularly the portuguese were under a lot of pressure and after the first day or two they did try hard but i think that pressure started to make them feel that this had to go away. I think, and you know, we, I mean, we, we know obviously there's been a lot of criticism of the Portuguese police, and obviously I've talked about it in my yes. book. But, you know, we, we kind of, we got over the first 24, 48 hours when opportunities were missed, like forensics, for example, yes. and roadblocks and blah, blah, blah. And then after that, we did actually feel that we were getting as good a search as we could get in Portugal with the systems that were in place. Yes. And we did have, obviously, assistance from the British police. And we did actually feel that we were developing a relationship mm -hmm. with the police, which was unusual because of the judicial secrecy uh, laws. So we did actually get to meet every sort of 10 days to two weeks, which is a lot, to be honest, when your child's missing, that's a really long time to wait for a snippet of information. But it was better than nothing. And when, when the Portuguese police decided that, you were, that this word that became common parlance for people who didn't know before, including myself, Aguido's suspects, um, why do you think they, they decided you were suspects? Because there was all talk of sniffer dogs and blood sure. being found and DNA being found and the boot of the car and all the, the rented car and so on. Did they, did, why do you think that they took you in? I as mean, I, 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 we felt strongly that we had already been eliminated just for the circumstances that we were there, the timings, we were in a group, etc. And we'd given our, our statements, but I think it was the pressure on them. And when the dogs came, which was actually something that happened at our request because yes. we wanted a more thorough search and the National Police Improvement Agency recommended these dogs and basically when the dogs barked in the apartment around a car suddenly it gave them an opportunity to portray us as if we were involved but it's ludicrous there because they said the dogs scented blood uh, that was possibly you know, mad and none, so you know the key thing with with these dogs is if you look at any of the manuals they say that they should be used as intelligence and anything any alert has to be corroborated uh, with the forensics and of course none of the forensics came back suggesting anything it, at all it was suggested you washed cuddle cat that the, the, the little toy that madeline was uh, clutched and again you said I mean, I just think it's ridiculous. It was 70 days later. You know, I've been holding Cuddle Cat the whole time just it's for filthy, comfort. Honest it was to filthy goodness. and suntan lotion. covered in suntan lotion you and You know, if, it, if, it re if that was really significant, if people think that was significant and that means something, why wasn't Cuddle Cat taken on the night or the day after and taken off for forensics? I mean, that's 70 days when they could have taken Cuddle Cat. I, want to, I do want to... I want to, I've got some other questions I want to go to, but there is a section of the audience, and, and have been saying it, and they've been contacting me on the radio show, and they, they, they might say it in the press as well, about they, they're convinced that you might have something to have done with, with Madeline's disappearance. Um, what do you say to them tonight? Read the book, I think. Read the book. You know, because... I mean, everything's in there. I mean, I can try and say to people, you know, I love my children so much, you know, but we're just... You've got a lovely family. You know, how, how are Sean no and way. Emily at the moment? How, are they co how old are they now? Six? Is Six. It? And how are they doing? They're great, honestly. They're brilliant. Uh, Where's Madeline in their head? What, what, what are they saying about her? Well, I mean, they speak about her every day. Um, they, they, they know what's happened. They know a man's taken her. Um, they, call, they call him the naughty man, and that's, that's their words. But they kind of see the man as a, as a burglar, which I guess he is. Um, and they know that that's wrong. They know that even if you really want something, you shouldn't take it if it doesn't belong to you. And they know that we're working really hard. That's basically my job now. Um, and that there's many people around the world that are helping us. And, and case, the, the, cases like this attract, a kind of, there's a kind of lunatic fringe. There's people who are trying, or they really want to help, but they mightn't be helpful. And they, they'll say, we've seen, there's been sightings in Morocco and Spain and Amsterdam and so forth. Um, 
I think, I think we've seen the best and the worst, actually. Oh, precisely, of, of, yeah. Of what, what, what happens when you get a call to say, I think I've seen her? Do, yeah. you, do you have hope or do you, are you... I mean, we try not to get too excited because there's been lots of sightings. Really? And, and the key thing with the sightings is they come in, if they come in to us, uh, the investigative team grade them. And if they're recent, a lot of them have been historical and there's not really much more you can do about it. If someone says, phones you up now and says, in June 2007, yeah. I saw Madeleine in Marrakesh, you know, it's not that helpful. But we log them all and obviously if there's a pattern of sightings, if okay. it's a recent sighting, uh, then our investigator will phone the people up and try to get more information. And obviously we want to verify things if they've got photographs in. That's hard because there's been one or two, I think, where you kind of... I kind of almost know it's not Madeline, but you know, you kind of you've still got that little hope, and you know. This picture that 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 uh, has been released recently is uh, it would show what we would hope is Madeline today, um, having celebrated her birthday this week, and, and you're you're happy enough with that representation of her now, are you, Kate? And well, that was that was done by the National Centre of Missing and Exploited Children in Washington, yes. and that was Madeline, sort of age six. Okay. We actually think it it looks older than six, so. She's eight now. I think yeah. the key thing, and quite a lot of people have sent us information yes. of little girls. There are three yeah. or four, yes. and we've got to remember now, Madeline's eight, so we're not looking for that. And what the artists say about these pictures are they don't have to be exact likenesses. The key thing is challenging the assumption of what you're looking for. And kids and other people look at other kids in a different way. Like, it doesn't matter how closely the picture resembles the child so long yes. as it does the job. You know, so. you know when, you, when you read about these peculiar cases like J.C. Dugard and, and, and Natasha Kampuch who had been considered to be gone forever yeah. in many respects and out of the blue. Do those cases give you cause for hope or concern or do, 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 you, do you register these things or do you? I definitely hope, uh, although the circumstances aren't nice, the important thing is in the public consciousness that yes. children can disappear off the radar for years and years and years mm -hmm. and be found and a key thing with the younger children is the younger the child, the more likely they are to be kept, taken to be kept. So, you know, it is important and people need to be aware and the public can play a big role in this. Can I, can I ask you a tough question uh, about um, where you're at in your heads vis-a-vis -vis things like guilt? Uh, do, does, that, does that plague you or are you, have you moved away from that emotion and sentiment, Kate? I think I've moved on a bit from where I was. Um, you know, there's no doubt that we'll always bitterly regret our decision that night, the, the way we were leaving the children and checking on them. Um, and in the early weeks, months, even years, to be honest, I used to just persecute myself over it. And you know, you'd, if you could put yourself in your child's place, you know, you'd do it in a second. You know. Is Madeline alive, Jerry? Well, they, I think the key thing for us, there's absolutely nothing to suggest that she isn't. And as parents, I don't think any parent could give up their child without having concrete evidence that they weren't alive. So in our mind, Madeline's alive and out there and waiting to be found. And, okay, and will, you, will you see her again? I certainly feel that. I don't feel that this is the end at all. Um, as you know, Jerry just said, there's no evidence. There's been several searches. There's been a search by experts um, from, from Britain and nothing was turned up. These cases of missing children again in just incredible situations that you'd never believe, you know. It's, it's, it's just a desperate, desperate story and uh, our thoughts are with you. We can't you. Uh, wish you anything but good luck in your ongoing search. You've written this book. It's not easy for you to come on and talk about this, this story this afternoon, this, this evening, I should say, and a lot of people wish you well in this country. I can say that to you. Can we thank everyone in Ireland? The support we've had has been... It's been out of this world, honestly. Absolutely about. remarkable, I think. Half our males come from Ireland and that's really what's kept us going. It's a support. Kate and Jeremy McCann, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.